The Dawn Flows Home to the Sea, Part 2, by Mikhail Sholokhov, continued. Well, he would hear no more. All the story was told. The day Grigor was due to go to the political department, he would clear out of the village, if necessary for a long time, where to he himself did not know, but he had firmly resolved to clear out. He had no desire either to die or to sit in prison. He had made his choice, but he did not want to talk about it prematurely to Aksinia. There was no point in poisoning her last few days with him. As it was, they were not so very cheerful. He must speak about it on the last day, he had decided. But now let her sleep calmly, her face in his armpit. Frequently during those nights she said, It's good for me to sleep under your wing. Well, let her sleep meantime. Poor wretch, she had no long time left in which to nestle against him. During the day Grigor played with the children, then went wandering aimlessly through the village. In company he felt more cheerful. One day Prokhor proposed meeting at Nikita Melnikov's to drink with the other young Cossacks who had been their regimental comrades. Grigor flatly refused. He knew from the villagers' conversation that they were discontented with the grain requisitioning and that there would inevitably be talk of this over the drinks. He did not wish to draw suspicion down on himself, and even when he chanced to meet acquaintances, he avoided talking about politics. He had had enough of politics. They had done him enough harm already. His caution was all the less superfluous because the grain requisitioning was yielding poor results, and in consequence three old men were arrested as hostages and sent under escort to Vyshenska. The following day, close to the cooperative shop, Grigor saw the former artilleryman Zakhar Kramskov, who had recently returned from the Red Army. He was thoroughly drunk and reeled as he walked. But as he came up to Grigor, he buttoned up all the buttons of his dirty jacket and said hoarsely, I wish you health, Grigor Pantelievich. Your health. Grigor shook the stocky and well-knit artilleryman's hefty fist. Do you recognize me? Why, of course. Do you remember how last year our battery saved you, close to Bukovskoy? Without us, your cavalry would have had a bad time. The Reds we bowled over that day, by hell. I was sighting for number one gun then. Zakhar beat his fist hollowly against his broad chest. Grigor looked furtively around. Some Cossacks, standing a little way off, were staring at them, listening to their conversation. The corners of Grigor's lips quivered, and he revealed his white, sturdy teeth in an angry snarl. You're drunk, he said in an undertone, through his clenched teeth. Go and sleep it off and don't talk so much. No, I'm not drunk, the fuddled artillery man shouted. Or maybe I'm drunk with misery. I've come home, but it's not life you live here, but bloody hell. The Cossacks don't live any more, and there aren't any Cossacks. Half a ton of grain they've requisitioned from me, and what do you call that? Did they sow it? that they have the right to take it away? Do they know what makes the grain grow? He stared with senseless bloodshot eyes and suddenly swaying, pawed Grigor, breathing heavy vodka fumes into his face. Why are you wearing trousers without stripes? Have you signed up as a peasant? We won't let you, my dear old Grigor Pantelievich. We've got to fight again. We'll say as we did last year, down with the commune, but hurrah for the Soviet regime. Grigor roughly pushed him away and muttered, Go home, you drunken swine. Do you know what you're saying? Kramskov thrust out one hand, spreading out the tobacco-stained fingers, and mumbled, Excuse me if there's something wrong. Excuse me, but I'm speaking sincerely to you as to my commander, as to my own father commander. We've got to fight. Grigor silently turned away and walked home across the square. The impression of this untimely meeting remained with him until evening. He recalled Kramskov's drunken shouts, the Cossacks' sympathetic silence and smiles, and thought, but I must clear out quickly. No good will come of this. He was due to go to Vyshenska on Saturday. Within three days he would have to leave his native village. But that was not to be. On Thursday night he was already getting ready for sleep. Someone knocked violently at the door. Aksinia went out into the porch. He heard her ask, Who's there? He did not catch the answer, but moved by a vague feeling of anxiety, 
He rose from the bed and went to the window. The latch rattled in the porch. The first to enter was Dunya. Grigor caught sight of her pale face, and even before he asked any questions, picked up his cap and greatcoat from the bench. Brother? What is it? he quietly asked as he thrust his arms into his greatcoat sleeves. Dunya hurriedly panted. Brother, clear out at once. Four horsemen have arrived from Vyshenska. They're sitting in the best room. They talked in whispers, but I heard. I stood close to the door and heard everything. I heard Mikhail say you must be arrested. He's telling them all about you. Clear out. Grigor strode swiftly across to her, put his arms around her, and kissed her strongly on the cheek. Thank you, sister. Now go back, or they'll notice you've come out. Goodbye. He turned to Oxenia. Bread, quick. No, not a whole loaf, only the crust. So his brief life of peace was at an end. He acted as though in a battle, hurriedly yet confidently. He went into the best room, cautiously kissed the sleeping children, then took Oxenia into his arms. Goodbye. I'll let you have news of myself soon. Prochor will tell you. Look after the children. Fasten the door. If they knock, say I've gone to Vyshenska. Well, goodbye, and don't grieve, Xenia. As he kissed her, he felt the warm, salty moisture of tears on his lips. He had no time to comfort her and to listen to her helpless, broken words. He gently unfastened the arms embracing him, strode into the porch, listened, then threw the outside door wide open. The chilly wind blowing up from the dawn lashed in his face. For a second he closed his eyes to get accustomed to the darkness. Oxenia heard the snow scrunching under Grigor's feet, and every step drove a sharp pain into her heart. Then the sound of footsteps died away, and the wattle fence creaked. Everything grew quite still. Only the wind howled in the forest beyond the dawn. She tried to catch some sound through the roar of the wind, but she heard nothing. She suddenly felt cold. She went into the kitchen and put out the lamp. Part 7 The Fugitive Chapter 1 Late in the autumn of 1920, when, owing to the poor results achieved by the grain requisitioning policy, the Soviet government found it necessary to organize grain collection detachments, unrest broke out among the Cossack population of the Don. Small armed bands sprang into existence in the upper Don districts of Shumilinsk, Kazanska, Migolinsk, Mieszkowski, Vyshenska, Yelanska, and elsewhere. These bands were the response of the richer section of the Cossackry to the organization of grain collection detachments and to the Soviet government's increasingly strict measures to carry out the grain requisitioning policy. The majority of the bands, which consisted of anything from five to twenty men, were formed from local Cossacks who were former active white guards. They included men who, during the years 1918 and 1919, had served in punitive detachments, non-commissioned officers and junior officers of the former Dawn Army who had evaded the Soviet September mobilization, insurgents who had distinguished themselves by military exploits and the execution of Red Army prisoners during the previous year's rising in the Upper Dawn area. In short, men who in no circumstances could settle down under the Soviet regime. The bands fell upon the requisitioning detachments in the villages, turned back villagers' wagons carrying grain to the collection points, killed communists and non-party Cossacks devoted to the Soviet regime, and struggled to the best of their knowledge and power. The task of exterminating these bands was entrusted to a garrison battalion for the Upper Don region, stationed at Vyshenska. But all the attempts to destroy the bands scattered over the extensive Don territory proved unsuccessful, primarily because the local inhabitants were sympathetic to the rebels, supplied them with food, informed them of the movements of the Red Army forces, and also concealed them from pursuit. But in addition, the battalion commander, Kaparin, a social revolutionary and former staff captain in the Tsarist army, was by no means anxious to see the elimination of the counter-revolutionary forces in his area, and did all he could to hinder operations against them. Only occasionally, when driven into action by the chairman of the party regional committee, did he make brief expeditions with his troops, 
quickly returning to Vyshenska on the pretext that he must not disperse his forces or take imprudent risks. Leaving Vyshenska and its regional organizations and warehouses without adequate defense. The battalion, which numbered some 400 bayonets and 14 machine guns, performed garrison duties. The men guarded prisoners, brought water, chopped down trees in the forest, and also, as part of their compulsory labor duty, collected gall nuts from oak trees for the manufacture of ink. The battalion successfully supplied wood and ink to all the numerous regional organizations and offices. But meantime, the number of small insurgent bands in the area was growing alarmingly. And not until December, when a considerable rising broke out in the Baguchar county of Valenyez province, contiguous with the Upper Don region, was the timber cutting and gall nut collecting perforce brought to an end. By order of the army commander of the Don province, the battalion, consisting of three companies and a machine gun section, was sent with the garrison cavalry squadron, the 1st Battalion of the 12th Grain Collecting Regiment, and two small local defense detachments to crush the rising. In a battle which was fought at the approaches to the village of Suhoi Donets, the Vyshenska squadron, commanded by Yakov Fomin, attacked the lines of insurgents on the flank, swept them away, put them to flight, and sabered some 170 men in the pursuit, while losing only three men. With few exceptions, every man in the squadron was a Cossack, a native of the Upper Don area. In this fight, they were once more faithful to the age-old Cossack traditions. Despite the protests of the two communists in the squadron, after the battle, almost half the men exchanged their old greatcoats and padded jackets for good sheepskins taken from the dead insurgents. A few days after the rising had been suppressed, the squadron was recalled to Kazanska. Here, Fomin rested from the burdens of military life, amusing himself to the best of his ability. An incorrigible woman chaser, a merry and sociable Cossack, he disappeared night after night, returning to his quarters only a little before dawn. When his men, with whom their commander was on familiar terms, saw Fomin in the street of an evening, with his boots brilliantly polished, they exchanged knowing winks and remarked, well, so our stallion is off to the mares again. Now he won't come out till dawn. Unknown to the squadron's commissar and political instructor, Fomin was in the habit of visiting the quarters of certain Cossacks with whom he was on good terms whenever they passed him the word that vodka was plentiful and a carousal was on the way. These visits occurred quite frequently. But soon the dashing commander grew bored and moody and almost entirely forgot his recent ways of finding amusement. He no longer cleaned his elegant leg boots so diligently of an evening, and did not bother to shave every day. He still occasionally dropped in for a drink at the quarters of fellow villagers in the squadron, but he did not take any great part in the conversation. The change in Fomin's behavior coincided with a report which he received from Vyshenska. The political department of the Don Cheka briefly informed him that at Mikhailovka, in the neighboring Ustmidvyedice area, a garrison battalion with its commander, Vakulin, had revolted. Vakulin happened to be a regimental comrade and friend of Fomin's. At one time they had served together in the insurgent Mironov Corps, and together they had piled their arms when that force was surrounded by the Budyoni cavalry. The friendly relations between Fomin and Vakulin had never been broken off, and only a little time before, at the beginning of September, Vakulin had visited Vyshenska. Even then he had ground his teeth and complained to his old friend about the domination of the commissars, who are ruining the farmers with their grain requisitioning and leading the country to perdition. In his heart, Fomin agreed with Vakulin's views, but he conducted himself discreetly, with a cunning which frequently served him in place of mother wit. Fomin was naturally cautious, never in a hurry, and never committing himself immediately one way or the other, but soon after he had learned of the revolt of Vakulin's battalion, his habitual caution forsook him. One evening, immediately prior to the squadron's departure for Vyshenska, a number of the Cossacks gathered in the quarters of the troop commander Alferov. A great horse bucket stood filled with vodka. An excited conversation went on around the table. Fomin, who was present at this drinking bout, listened in silence to the talk, 
and as silently bailed out vodka from the bucket. But when one of the Cossacks began to recall how they had gone into the attack close to Suhoi Donets, Fomin, thoughtfully twisting his mustache, interrupted him. We cut down the Ukrainians pretty well, boys, but let's hope we ourselves shan't be grieving before long. Supposing when we get back to Vyshenska, we find the grain collection detachments have pumped all the grain out of our homes. The Kazanska people are thoroughly angry with the grain detachments. They sweep the bottoms of the corn bins clean with brooms. A hush fell over the room. Fomin looked at his men and said with a forced smile, I was only joking. Watch out and don't let your tongues wag, for the devil knows what a joke can sound like to others. On his return to Vyshenska, Fomin, accompanied by half a troop of his cavalry, rode home to Rubiezhin village. He did not ride right into his yard, but dismounted at the gate, flung the rein to one of his men, and strode into the hut. He nodded coldly to his wife, made a low bow to his mother, and respectfully shook her hand, then embraced his children. But where's father, he asked, as he sat down on a stool and placed his saber between his knees. Gone to the mill, his mother answered. Glancing at her son, she sternly ordered him, Take off your cap, you heathen, whoever sits under the icon with his cap on. Ah, Yakov, your head will be the death of you. Fomin smiled forcedly and removed his cap, but made no attempt to take off his outdoor clothes. Why aren't you taking off your coat, his mother demanded. I've only ridden home for a minute or two on a visit. I never get time when on service. We know your service, the old woman said harshly, hinting at her son's dissolute behavior and his associations with women at Vyshenska. The rumors of his conduct had long been going the rounds of Rubiezhin. Fomin's wife, a prematurely aged, pale-faced, and downtrodden woman, glanced in alarm at her mother-in-law and went off to the stove to do something to please her husband, to ingratiate herself with him, and to win at least one gracious look. She took a rag from under the stove, went down on her knees and bent double, set to work to clean off the thick mud clinging to his boots. What fine boots you've got, Yasha. But they're very muddy. I'll get them clean for you. I'll clean them till they shine, she whispered almost inaudibly, not raising her head, crawling on her knees round her husband's feet. He had not lived with her for years, and for years he had not had any feeling except a faint, contemptuous pity for this woman whom in his youth he had loved, but she had gone on loving him and forgave him everything, secretly hoping that he would come back to her sooner or later. For many long years she had carried on the farm, brought up the children, and done all she could to please her capricious mother-in-law. All the burden of the field labor fell on her meager shoulders. Excessive labor and an ailment which had afflicted her after the birth of their second child had sapped her strength more and more as the years passed. She had grown very thin, her face had lost its bloom. Premature old age had thrown a spider web of furrows over her cheeks. The expression of terrified humility, which is found in the eyes of intelligent sick animals, appeared in her eyes. She herself did not realize how swiftly she was aging, how her health was declining with every day, and she still clung to hope. And on the rare occasions when they met, she gazed at her handsome husband, with a timid love and admiration. Fomin stared down at his wife's miserably bowed back and the gaunt, sharply outlined shoulder blades beneath her blouse, at her large, trembling hands, diligently cleaning the mud from his boots, and thought, She's a beauty, and no mistake, and that's what I slept with at one time, but she's aged terribly. How she has aged. That's enough. I'll only get them muddy again, he said in a tone of annoyance, freeing his foot from his wife's hands. She painfully straightened her back and rose to her feet. A faint flush appeared on her yellow cheeks. There was such an expression of love and dog-like devotion in her humid eyes as she looked at Fomin that he turned away and asked his mother, Well, and how are you all getting on? Just the same, the old woman replied morosely. Has a grain-collecting detachment been in the village? It rode off to Nizhny Krivska only yesterday. Did they take any grain from us? Yes. How much did they take, Davidka? Grandad saw them, he knows. I think it was ten sacks. Ah. 
Bowman rose, glanced curtly at his son, and adjusted his sword belt. His face turned pale as he asked, Did you tell them whose grain they were taking? The old woman waved her hand and smiled, not without a hint of malevolence. They don't take much note of you. Their commander said, Everybody without distinction has got to hand over their surplus grain, even if he is foaming, even if he's the regional chairman himself. All the same, we're going to take the surplus grain. And with that, they began to rummage in the corn bins. I'll deal with them, Mother. I'll deal with them, Foman said thickly, and took a hurried leave of his family. After this visit to his home, he began discreetly to ascertain the feeling of the men in his squadron, and was easily enough convinced that the majority of them were dissatisfied with the grain requisitioning policy. Their wives and near and distant relations from the various villages and districts came on visits to them and told of how the grain-collecting detachments were carrying out searches and were collecting all the grain, leaving only enough for seed and food. As a result, at a garrison meeting held in Bosky at the end of January, men of the squadron openly interrupted a speech by the regional military commissar Shachayev. Shouts came from their ranks, Call off the requisitioning detachments. It's time to finish taking our grain. Down with the requisitioning commissars. In reply, the Red Army men of the garrison company shouted, Counter-revolutionaries, break up those swine and send them to different regiments. The meeting was long and stormy. One of the few communists in the garrison said anxiously to Fomin, You must say something, comrade Fomin. Look at the game your squadron men are playing. Fomin smiled beneath his mustache. But I'm a non-party man. Do you think they'll pay any attention to me? He did not break his silence and left the meeting long before it ended. He went out together with the battalion commander, Kaparin. On the way to Vyashenska, they fell to talking about the situation which had arisen and very quickly found a common language. A week later, during a talk in Fomin's quarters, Kaparin told him frankly, Either we act now or we shall never act. Get that clear, Yakov Yefimovich? We must take advantage of the opportunity. It's a very suitable moment. The Cossacks will support us. You have great authority throughout the region. The people will never be in a more favorable mood. Why are you silent? Make up your mind. What have I got to make up my mind about? Fomin slowly pronounced, drawling his words and looking from under his brows. The question's already decided. Only we must work out a plan to be sure everything goes smoothly so that there won't be any mess-up. Let's talk about that. The suspicious friendship between Fomin and Kaparin did not go unnoticed. Several communists in the battalion organized a watch over them and communicated their suspicions to Artemyev, the head of the political department, and to Shachayev, the military commissar. A startled raven's afraid of a bush, Artemyev said with a laugh. Kaparin's a coward. Do you think he's likely to take any decisive step? We'll watch Fomin. We've had our eye on him for a long time now. Only it's doubtful whether Fomin himself will dare to do anything. It's all your imagination, he concluded decisively. But it was now rather late to watch Fomin, for the conspirators had already come to an understanding. The rising was fixed to begin on March 12th at 8 in the morning. It was agreed that on that day Fomin was to lead the squadron out for morning exercises in full fighting array. Then they would make a sudden attack on the machine gun section stationed on the outskirts of Vyshenska, capture the guns, and afterwards assist the garrison company to carry out a purge of the regional organizations. Kaparin was uncertain whether all the battalion would support him and mentioned his doubts to Fomin. Fomin listened carefully and said, So long as we can capture the machine guns, we'll suppress your battalion in two seconds. The close watch kept on Fomin and Kaparin yielded no results. They met very rarely, and then only in connection with service matters, and not till the end of February did a patrol see them together in the street one night. Fomin was leading his saddled horse by the rein. Kaparin was walking beside him. When challenged, Kaparin answered, Friend! They turned into Kaparin's quarters. Fomin tied his horse to the balustrade of the porch. They did not light a light in Kaparin's room. Fomin left at four in the morning, mounted his horse, and rode to his quarters. 
That was all the patrol was able to establish. The regional military commander, Shachayev, reported his suspicions of Fomin and Kaparin in a code telegram to the army commander of the Don province. A few days later, he received an answer from the commander, sanctioning the removal of Fomin and Kaparin from their posts and their arrest. At a conference of the Bureau of the Regional Party Committee, it was decided to inform Fomin that by an order of the regional military commissariat, he had been recalled to Novicherkas and placed at the disposition of the army commander, and that he was to hand over command of the squadron to his assistant, Avchinikov. The squadron was to be sent the same day to Kazanska on the pretext that an armed band had arrived there, while the conspirators were to be arrested the next night. The decision to shift the squadron from Vyshenska was reached out of fear that it might revolt when it learned of Fomin's arrest. The command of the second company of the garrison battalion, a communist named Tkachenko, was instructed to warn the communist members of the battalion and the platoon commanders of the possibility of a rising and to hold the company and the machine gun section in fighting order. Fomin was informed of the order for his recall next morning. All right, you take over the squadron of Chinikov. I'm going to Novicherkas, he said calmly. Do you want to go through the accounts? Of Chinikov, a non-party troop commander who had received no warning and had no suspicions, buried himself in the papers. Fomin took the opportunity to write a note to Kaparin. We act today. I've been recalled. Get ready. In the porch, he handed the note to his orderly and whispered, Put it in your cheek. Ride at a walking pace. Understand? Ride to Kaparin at a walking pace. Hand the note to him and return here at once. If anyone stops you on the road, swallow it. On receiving the order to lead the squadron to Kazanska district center, Apchinikov paraded the Cossacks in the church square in readiness for the march. Fomin rode up to him. May I say goodbye to the squadron? By all means, only get it over quickly. Don't hold us up. Placing himself before the squadron, reining in his prancing horse, Fomin turned to the men. You all know me, comrades. You know what I've always fought for. I've always been with you. But today I can't accept a state of things in which the Cossacks are being pillaged, when the men who grow the grain are being pillaged. And that is why I have been released from my command and I know well what they intend to do to me. That is why I want to say goodbye to you. For a second, Fomin's speech was interrupted by cries and uproar among the squadron. He stood in his stirrups and sharply raised his voice. If you want to free yourselves of this pillaging, drive out the requisitioning detachments. Kill the commissars like Shachayev. They've come to the dawn. His last words were drowned out in the tumult. Waiting for a moment, he sonorously gave the order... By right in threes, right wheel, quick march. The squadron obediently carried out the command. Dumbfounded by this turn, Avchinikov rode up to Fomin and demanded, Where are you going, comrade Fomin? Without turning his head, Fomin jestingly answered, Just for a ride round the church. Only then did Avchinikov take in the significance of all that had been occurring during those last few minutes. He rode his horse out of the file, being followed by the political instructor, the vice commissar, and one man. Fomin noticed that they were missing only when they had gone a couple of hundred paces. Turning his horse, he shouted, Avchinikov, halt! The four riders spurred their mounts out of their easy trot into a gallop. Clumps of half-melting snow went flying in all directions from the horse's hoofs. Fomin gave the command, Weapons at the ready! Capture Avchinikov! First troop, after them. A ragged volley of shots rang out. The sixteen men of the first troop dashed off in pursuit. Meantime, Fomin split the rest of the squadron into two groups. He sent one group, under Chumakov, the commander of the third troop, to disarm the machine gun section, and himself led the rest towards the spot where the garrison company was stationed on the northern outskirts of the village in large stables. Firing in the air and waving their sabers, the first insurgent group galloped along the main street. They sabered four communists as they went, hurriedly formed up on the outskirts, and silently, without a cheer, charged into the attack against the Red Army men of the machine gun section as they came running out of their quarters. The house in which the machine gun section was quartered stood a little apart from the rest of the village, 
but only some two hundred paces separated it from the last houses. The Cossacks were met by machine gun fire at point-blank range and at once turned back. Three of them were hit and bowled out of their saddles before they could reach the nearest lane. The attempt to take the machine gunners by surprise had failed. The insurgents did not try again. The commander of the group led his men under cover. Without dismounting, he warily peered round the corner of a stone-built shed and said, They've rolled out a couple more maxims. He wiped his sweaty brow with his fur cap and turned to the others. We'll ride back, boys. Let Fomin capture the machine gunners himself. How many have we left lying on the snow? Three? Well, let him try his hand himself. As soon as firing broke out in the eastern outskirts of the village, the company commander, Tkachenko, dashed out of his quarters, dressing as he went, and ran to the barracks. Some thirty Red Army men were already drawn up in rank outside. They greeted him with a rain of questions. Who's shooting? What's up? Without answering, he ordered the Red Army men who came pouring out of the barracks to fall in also. Several communists, workers in the regional organizations who had run to the barracks, also stood in the rank. Scattered rifle shots sounded in the village. Somewhere on the western outskirts there was the dull thud of a hand grenade. Seeing some fifty horsemen galloping with bared sabers towards the barracks, Tkachenko unhurriedly drew his pistol out of its holster. In the ranks, all talk died away, and the men brought their rifles to the ready before he had time to give the order. But there are men coming. Look, there's our battalion commander, Comrade Kaparin, one Red Army man shouted. Tearing along the street, the horsemen suddenly, as though by command, bent over the necks of their horses and galloped furiously towards the barracks. Don't let them come near, Tkachenko shouted sharply. The volley which rang out drowned his voice. When the riders were still a hundred paces away from the serried rank of Red Army men, four flew out of their saddles, and the others scattered in disorder and turned back. A rattle of shots cracked after them. One of the riders, evidently lightly wounded, fell from his saddle, but held on to the rein. For twenty yards or so he was dragged by his galloping horse. Then he jumped to his feet, clutched at a stirrup and the rear pommel of the saddle, and the next moment he was back in his seat. Pulling furiously on the reins, he turned his horse sharply as it galloped and vanished down the nearest lane. The men of the first troop vainly pursued Ovchinikov and returned to the village. A search for the commissar Shachayev was also fruitless. He was neither in the deserted military commissariat nor in his quarters. The moment he heard the sound of firing, he rushed down to the dawn, crossed over on the ice into the forest, thence to the village of Bazki, and the next day he was in Ustapiersk district, a good forty miles from Vyshenska. The majority of the leading regional officials managed to get away in time, nor was it safe to search for them, as the Red Army men of the machine gun section had advanced with hand machine guns to the center of Vyshenska and had covered all the streets leading to the main square, the men of the squadron abandoned the search, dropped down to the dawn, and rode to the church square, where they had been taken over by Fomin. Soon all the men were assembled. They again fell in. Fomin gave orders for guards to be set and for the others to go to their quarters, but to keep their horses saddled. Fomin, Kaparin, and the troop commanders took counsel together in one of the houses on the outskirts. Everything's lost, Kaparin exclaimed in despair, dropping impotently on a bench. Yes, we haven't captured the district center, so we shan't be able to hold out here, Fomin said quietly. We must ride round the region, Yakov Yefimovich. What's the point of our getting frightened now? In any case, we shan't die before we're dead. We'll raise the Cossacks, and then the district center will be ours, Chumakov proposed. Fomin stared at him without speaking and turned to Kaparin. Feeling down in the mouth, Your Excellency? Stop sniveling. You may as well be hanged for a sheep as a lamb. We've begun together, now let's carry on together. What do you think? Should we withdraw from Vyshensko or try again? Chumakov said sharply, Let others try. I'm not going to face a machine gun. That's a hopeless game. I'm not asking you. You shut up. Fomin glanced at Chumakov, who turned his eyes away. 
After a moment, Kaparin said, Yes, of course, it's senseless to try a second time now. They've got the superiority in weapons. They've got fourteen machine guns, and we haven't won. And they've got more men. We must retire and organize the Cossacks in a rising. While the Reds are being sent reinforcements, the whole region will be in the grip of the revolt. That's our only hope. There's no other. After a long silence, Fomin said, Well, we'll have to decide on that. Troop commanders, immediately check up on the equipment and find out how many cartridges each man has. Give the strict order that not a single cartridge is to be wasted. The first man who disobeys, I'll saber myself. Tell the men that. He was silent for a moment, then angrily banged his enormous fist down on the table. Ah, those damned machine guns. And it's all your fault, Chumakov. If we'd managed to capture even four of them, now, of course, they'll drive us out of the place. Well, dismiss. We'll spend the night in Vyshenska, if we're not driven out, and at dawn we'll advance into the region. The night passed quietly. At one end of Vyshenska were the men of the insurgent squadron, at the other the garrison battalion with the communists and young communists who had joined it. Only two blocks of houses separated the enemies, but neither side dared to make a night attack. Next morning, the squadron abandoned the village without a fight and made off in a southeasterly direction. Chapter 2 For three weeks after Grigor had left home, he lived in the village of Vyachnyakrivoy in Yelanska district, staying with a Cossack acquaintance who had been his regimental comrade. Then he moved on to the village of Gorbatovsky, where he lived for more than a month with a distant relative of Aksinya's. For days on end, he remained in the best room, going out into the yard only at night. But this life was as bad as being in prison. He was downcast, oppressed by his inactivity. He was almost irresistibly drawn homeward to his children, to Aksinya. Frequently, during his sleepless nights, he put on his greatcoat, firmly resolved to go back to Tatarsk. But each time he changed his mind and took off his coat again, throwing himself with a groan face downward on the bed. This existence was trying him beyond endurance. The master, his host, who was Aksinya's great uncle, sympathized with him, but he could not keep such a lodger forever. One evening after supper, Grigor, who had gone to his room, overheard the mistress asking in a voice thin with hatred, And when is all this to end? All what? What are you talking about? The master answered in his deep voice. When are we going to get rid of this idle guzzler? Hold your tongue. I won't. We've got so little grain left that it would make a cat weep, and yet you're keeping and feeding this hunchbacked devil day after day. How long is this going on, I ask you? And supposing the Soviet finds out, they'll take off our heads and our children will be left orphans. Hold your tongue, Avdotya. I won't. We've got children to think of. We haven't got more than about 700 pounds of grain left, and you've been feeding this drone. What is he to you? Your own brother? Your son-in-law's father? A cousin? He's not any near relation to you. So far as you're concerned, he's first cousin Jelly to second cousin Water. And yet you're keeping him, giving him food and drink. Ah, oh, you bald-headed devil. Hold your tongue, don't bark at me, or I'll go to the Soviet myself tomorrow and tell them the sort of flower you're in love with in this house. Next day, the master came into Grigor's room and said, staring down at the floor, Grigor Pantelievich, think what you like, but you can't stay here any longer. I respect you, and I knew your dead father and respected him, but it's difficult for me to go on keeping you eating our victuals. And besides, I'm afraid the government might find out about you. I don't want to lose my head through you. Forgive me, for Christ's sake, but free us of yourself. Good, Grigor said curtly. Thank you for giving me food and shelter. Thank you for everything. I can see for myself that I'm a burden to you, but where am I to go? All my paths are closed. Go wherever you like. All right, I'll leave today. Thank you for everything, Artaman Vasilievich. There's nothing to thank me for. I shan't forget your kindness. Maybe I shall be able to do you a service some day. Deeply moved, the master clapped Grigor on the back. Why talk about it? 
So far as I'm concerned, you could stay here for another couple of months, but the wife won't allow it. She carries on at me every day, damn her. I'm a Cossack and you're a Cossack, Grigor Pantelievich. You and I are both against the Soviet regime, and I'll help you. You go today to the village of Yagodny. My son's father-in-law lives there. He'll take you in. Tell him Artaman says he's to take you in as if you were his own son, to feed you and keep you as long as he can. And he and I will settle accounts later. Only you leave us this very day. I mustn't keep you here any longer. The wife's the master in this house. And besides, I'm afraid the Soviet may find out. You've been able to stay here, Grigor Pantelievich, and we'll call it enough. I've got some regard for my own head. Grigor left the house late that night, but he had not reached the windmill standing on the hill above the village when three horsemen seemed to spring out of the earth and stopped him. Halt, you son of a bitch! Who are you? Grigor's heart beat violently. Without saying a word, he stopped. To run would have been madness. There was neither hole nor bush anywhere near the road, only the bare, empty step. He could not have gone two yards. A communist? Get back, damn you! Now, quick! Riding his horse at Grigor, a second man ordered him, Hands up! Take them out of your pockets! Out with them, or I'll slash your head off. Grigor silently took his hands out of his greatcoat pockets, and still not understanding what had happened and who these men were, he asked, Where am I to go? To the village. Turn back. A single horseman escorted him to the village. The two others left them at the pasturage and rode off to the high road. Grigor walked along without speaking. When he came to the road, he slowed down his steps and asked, Listen, who are you? Get on, get on, no talking. Put your hands behind you, do you hear? Grigor silently obeyed, but a little later he asked again, All the same, who are you? Greek Orthodox. I'm not an old believer myself. Well, you can be glad you're not. Where are you taking me to? To the commander. Get on, get on, you reptile, or I'll... The man gently pricked Grigor with the point of his saber. The keen, cold steel stung his bare neck just between his greatcoat collar and his fur cap, and for a moment a feeling of terror flared up like a spark within him to be followed by impotent anger. The Dawn Flows Home to the Sea, Part 2, by Mikhail Sholokhov, continued. The keen, cold steel stung his bare neck just between his greatcoat collar and his fur cap, and for a moment a feeling of terror flared up like a spark within him to be followed by impotent anger. Turning up his collar, half swinging round to glance at his convoy, he said through his teeth, Don't play the fool, do you hear? Otherwise I may get that thing away from you. Move on, you scum, and don't talk. I'll get you away. Hands behind you. Grigor went on for a few paces in silence, then said, I'll be quiet without your swearing at me. What a swine you are. Don't look back. I'm not looking back. Hold your tongue and move quicker. Perhaps you'd like me to run, Grigor asked, brushing the clinging snowflakes from his eyelashes. Without answering, the escort touched up his horse. The animal's chest, wet with sweat in the dampness of the night, jolted Grigor in the back, a hoof squelched into the thawing snow by his feet. Not so much of that, Grigor shouted, pushing his hand against the animal's chest. The escort raised his sword to the level of his head and said in a quiet tone, You get on, you bitches, bastard, and no talking, or I shan't take you all the way. I'm rather quick at that sort of thing. Shut up and not a word more. They went in silence as far as the village. By the first yard, the escort reined in his horse and said, Go through that gate. Grigor passed through a gate which was standing wide open. In the heart of the yard, he saw a spacious sheet-iron roofed house. Under the eaves of a shed, horses were snorting and juicily chewing. Six or more armed men were hanging around the porch. 
The escort sheathed his saber and said as he dismounted, Go into the house, straight along the passage, and the first door on the left. Get on and no looking round. How many times have I got to tell you? Griegor slowly went up the steps of the porch. By the balustrade, a man dressed in a long cavalry greatcoat and a red army cap was standing. He asked, Caught someone, then? Yes, the familiar hoarse voice of Griegor's convoy answered reluctantly. Caught him close to the windmill. Who is he, the secretary of the party group? The devil knows, some swine, but we'll soon find out who he is. Either this is a white band or the Vyshenska Chika men are trying to be clever and are pretending to be whites. I'm caught like any mug, Gregor thought, deliberately hanging back in the porch, trying to collect his thoughts. The first man he saw when he opened the door was Fomin. He was sitting at a table surrounded by a number of men dressed in military uniforms, all of them strangers to Gregor. Great coats and sheepskins were flung in a disorderly heap on the bed, carbines were piled by the bench, and on the bench itself was a mixed array of sabers, bandoliers, saddlebags, and wallets. The men, the great coats, the equipment all gave off the strong scent of horses' sweat. Gregor removed his fur cap and quietly said, Hello. Myalyukov. Well, in very truth, the step is broad, but the road is narrow. So fate has brought us together again. Where have you turned up from? Take your coat off. Come in and sit down. Fomin rose from the table and went across to Gregor, holding out his hand. What were you doing hanging around here? I've come to the village on business. What business? It's rather a long way for you to come. Fomin stared at Gregor inquisitively. Tell the truth. You were in hiding here, weren't you? That's the whole truth, Gregor answered, smiling forcedly. But where did my lads get hold of you? Outside the village. Where were you going? I was following my nose. Fomin again stared closely into Gregor's eyes and smiled. I can see you're thinking we've caught you to carry you off to Vyshenska. No, brother, that road is blocked to us. Don't be afraid. We've finished serving the Soviet regime. We couldn't settle down to live with it. We've had a divorce, an elderly Cossack, smoking by the stove, said in a deep voice. One of the men sitting at the table burst into a loud laugh. Haven't you heard anything from me? Fomin asked Gregor. No. Well, sit down at the table and we'll talk. Cabbage soup and meat for our guest. Gregor did not believe a word Fomin had said. Pale and restrained, he took off his coat and sat down. He wanted a smoke but he remembered that he had not had any tobacco for the last two days. "'Have you got anything to smoke?' he asked Fomin. Fomin complacently held out his leather cigarette case. It did not escape his notice that as Gregor took the cigarette his hands trembled, and Fomin smiled again in his curling, ruddy mustache. "'We've risen against the Soviet regime. We're for the people and against grain requisitioning and the commissars.' They've made fools of us for a long time, but now we'll make fools of them. Do you understand, Melyukov? Gregor said nothing. He smoked, taking hurried draws at his cigarette. His head began to swim, and a feeling of nausea rose in his throat. He had been living on poor food during the past month, and only now did he feel how weak he had grown. Putting out his cigarette, he greedily set to work on the food. Fomin briefly told him about the rising and the first days of their wanderings about the region, magniloquently calling these wanderings a raid. Gregor listened in silence and swallowed down bread and the greasy, badly cooked lamb stew almost without chewing. But you've grown thin while you've been enjoying other people's hospitality, Fomin said with a benevolent laugh. Hiccuping in his satiation, Gregor snorted, I haven't been living with my mother-in-law. I can see that. Eat up. Stuff as much as you can into yourself. We're not niggardly masters. Thank you. Now I'd like a smoke. Gregor took the cigarette offered him, went to a pot standing on a bench, and taking the wooden mug, bailed up some water. It was icy cold and slightly salt to the taste. Fuddled by his heavy meal, he greedily drank two large mugfuls of water, then began to enjoy his cigarette. The Cossacks aren't making us too welcome, 
Fomin continued his story, seating himself beside Gregor. They were badly shaken up during the rising last year. Still, we've got some volunteers. About forty men have joined us. But that isn't what we're after. What we're after is to raise the whole region, and for the neighboring regions, Khapiersk and Ustmyedvyedice, to help us too. And then we'll have a heart-to-heart -heart talk with the Soviet regime. A noisy conversation was going on at the table. While Grigor listened to Fomin, he furtively examined his companions. Not one familiar face. He still did not believe Fomin, but thought he was being cunning, and he discreetly held his peace. But he could not remain silent all the time. If you're serious in what you say, comrade Fomin, what is it you want? To start a new war? he asked, trying to resist the drowsiness which was overcoming him. I've already told you about that. You want to change the government? Yes. And what sort do you want to put in its place? Our own Cossack government. A government of Ottomans? Well, we'll wait a bit before we talk about the Ottomans. The government the people choose is the one we'll set up. But that isn't an urgent question. My job is to destroy the commissars and communists, and Kaparin, my chief of staff, will tell you all about the government. He's my brains where that question's concerned. He's a brainy man and educated. Fomin bent towards Grigor and whispered, He's a former staff captain of the Tsarist army, a clever fellow. He's asleep in the other room at the moment. He's not too well, probably through not being used to this sort of life. We've been making some long marches. In the porch, there was a sudden uproar, the stamping of feet, a groan, a quiet scuffling and a muffled shout. Give it to him! The talk at the table immediately died away. Fomin looked expectantly at the door. It was flung open. A billowing white cloud of vapor poured into the room. Driven forward by a resounding blow on the back, a tall, bareheaded man in a quilted khaki jacket and gray felt boots took several impetuous stumbling paces and struck his shoulder hard against the ledge of the stove. From the porch came a cheerful shout before the door was slammed. Here's one more for you. Fomin rose and adjusted the belt around his tunic. Who are you? he asked authoritatively. Panting, the man in the quilted jacket passed his hand over his hair, tried to wriggle his shoulders, and frowned with pain. He had been struck on the spine with something heavy, probably a rifle butt. Can't you speak? Have you lost your tongue? Who are you? I asked. A Red Army soldier. From what force? The Twelfth Grain Requisitioning Regiment. Aha! This is a find, one of the men sitting at the table declared with a smile. Fomin continued the examination. What were you doing here? We were trying to hold. We were sent... Of course. How many of you were there in the village? Fourteen. Where are the others? The Red Army man did not answer. He had difficulty in opening his lips. A bubbling noise came from his throat... A thin stream of blood flowed out of the left corner of his mouth and over his chin. He wiped his lips with his hands, looked at his palm, and wiped it on his trousers. That's your swine, he said in a gurgling voice, swallowing his blood. They've injured my lungs. Never you fear, we'll get you well, a stocky Cossack said jestingly, rising from the table and winking at the others. Where are the rest of you, Fomin asked again. "'Gone to Yelanska with the baggage train. "'And where are you from? "'In what district were you born?' "'The man looked at Fomin with feverishly glittering blue eyes, "'spat out a clot of blood onto the floor, "'and answered in a clear, resonant bass, "'Pskov province!' "'We've heard of that place,' Fomin said with a sneer. "'You've come a long way for other people's grain, my lad. "'Well, talk no more. "'What are we to do with you, eh? "'You must release me.' You're a simple sort, my lad, but maybe we will release you. What do you say, boys? Laughing in his mustache, Fomin turned to the men sitting at the table. Grigor, who had been watching closely, saw quiet, understanding smiles on the brown, weather-beaten faces. He can serve with us for a couple of months, and then we'll let him go home to his wife, one of the men said. Maybe you will serve with us? Fomin asked, vainly trying to hide his smile. We'll give you a horse and saddle, 
and instead of your felt boots, you shall have new leg boots with shaped calves. Your commanders don't fit you out very well. Do you call that footwear? There's a thaw outside, and you're going about in felt boots. Will you join us? He's a peasant. He's never ridden horseback in his life, one of the Cossacks lisped in a falsetto voice, pretending to be a half-wit. The Red Army man was silent. He leaned his back against the stove, looking about him with eyes that had grown clear and bright. From time to time he frowned with pain, gaping when he found it difficult to get his breath. Will you join us or what? Fomin asked again. But who are you? Who are we? Fomin raised his eyebrows and stroked his whiskers with his palm. We're fighters for the toiling people. We're against the oppression of the commissars and communists. That's who we are. Then Grigor suddenly saw a smile on the man's face. So that's who you are. I was wondering who you could be. The prisoner smiled, revealing teeth stained with blood, and he spoke as though he were pleasantly surprised by the news he had heard. But in his voice there was also a note which caused everybody in the room to prick up his ears. So you call yourself fighters for the people? Mm, yes, but in our language you're just bandits. And you want me to serve you? You're joking, simply joking. You're a bit of a wag, too, I can see that. Fomin screwed up his eyes and curtly asked, A communist? No, of course not. I'm non-party. You don't sound like it. On my word, I'm non-party. Fomin cleared his throat and turned to the table. Chumakov, put him out. It's not worthwhile killing me. Not at all, the man said quietly. The only answer was silence. Chumakov, a well-built handsome Cossack in an English leather jerkin, unwillingly rose from the table, smoothing his already sleek blond hair. I'm fed up with this duty, he said boldly, taking his saber from the heap flung down on the bench and trying the blade with his thumb. You haven't got to do it yourself. Tell the boys in the yard, Fomin counseled him. Chumakov coldly ran his eyes over the prisoner from head to foot and said, Go in front, my boy. The Red Army man staggered away from the stove, huddled into himself, and slowly went towards the door, leaving the damp traces of his wet felt boots on the floor. He might have wiped his boots when he came in. You turn up, leave the marks of your feet all over the place, and make the floor muddy. What a dirty beast you are, brother, Chumakov said with feigned annoyance as he followed the prisoner. Tell them to take him into the lane or into the threshing floor. It mustn't be done close to the house or the masters will be upset, Fomin shouted after him. He went across to Grigor, sat down beside him, and asked, We give them a short trial, don't we? Yes, Grigor answered, avoiding his eyes. Fomin sighed. It can't be helped. That's how it's got to be now. He was about to say something more, but there was a noisy tramping of feet in the porch. Someone shouted, and a single shot cracked resonantly. "'May the devil torment them out there!' Fomin exclaimed in an angry tone. One of the men sitting at the table jumped up and kicked the door open. "'What's happening out there?' he shouted into the darkness. Chumakov came in and excitedly reported, "'He proved to be quite smart! What a devil for you! He jumped from the top step and ran! I had to waste a cartridge on him! The boys outside are finishing him off! Tell them to drag him out of the yard into the lane. I've told them already, Yakov Yefimich. The room was quiet for a moment. Then someone asked, stifling a yawn, What's the weather like, Chumakov? Is it clearing up? It's cloudy. If it rains, it'll wash the last snow away. But what do you want it to rain for? I don't want it to. I've no desire to go squelching through mire. Grigor went to the bed and picked up his cap. Where are you going? Fomin asked to get a breath of air. He went out on the porch. The moon was shining dimly through clouds. The spacious yard, the roofs of the sheds, the summits of the poplars, the horses standing covered with horse cloths at the hitching posts were all illumined with the translucent dove blue light of midnight. Several yards from the porch lay the Red Army man, his head in a faintly gleaming puddle of thaw water. Three Cossacks were bent over him, talking quietly as they did something to him. 
He's still breathing, by God, one of them said in a vexed tone. What did you kill him like that for, you clumsy devil? I told you to aim at his head. Ah, you unsalted soup. A hoarse-voiced Cossack, the same man who had brought in Gregor, answered, He'll peg out. He'll give one belch and peg out. But lift his head up. I can't get the coat off anyhow. Lift him by the hair. That's right. And now hold him. Gregor heard the splash of water. One of the men standing over the prisoner straightened up. The hoarse-voiced Cossack, who was squatting down, grunted as he pulled the quilted jacket off the body. A moment or two later, he said, I've got a light hand, and that's why he didn't snuff out at once. When I was at home, if we happened to be slaughtering a boar, Hold him up! Don't let him drop! Oh, damn it. As I was saying, I'd start to slaughter the boar, and I'd slash him right across the throat. I'd drive the knife right into his neck, and even then the damned animal would get up and walk about the yard, and he'd go on walking for quite a long time after. Streaming with blood he'd be, but he'd still go on living. So I must have a light hand. Well, drop him. Is he still breathing? You don't say. Yet my saber split his skull almost to his brain. The third man spread out the dead man's jacket over his outstretched arm and said, We've stained the left side with blood. It's sticking to my hands. Plah! The filth! It'll wipe off. It isn't grease, the hoarse-voiced man said, and squatted down again. It'll wipe off or wash off at any rate. It isn't serious. Now what are you going to do? Thinking of taking his trousers off, too? the first Cossack asked discontentedly. The hoarse-voiced man sharply answered, If you're in a hurry or want to go to the horses, we'll manage here without you. We can't let good things go begging. Grigor turned on his heel and went back into the house. Fomin welcomed him with a swift, appraising glance and rose. Let's go into the other room and talk. There's too much of a row going on here, he proposed. The spacious, warmly heated room stank of mice and hemp seed. A small man in a khaki tunic was sleeping stretched out on the bed. His thin hair was disheveled and sprinkled with fluff and tiny feathers. He lay with his cheek pressed against the ticking of a dirty pillow. The lamp hanging from the ceiling lit up his pale, long, unshaven face. Fomin awakened him and said, Get up, Kaparin. We've got a guest. This is Gregor Melyukov, a friend and a former company commander. Kaparin hung his legs over the edge of the bed, wiped his face with his sleeve, and got up. He shook Gregor's hand, making a slight bow. Very pleased to meet you. I'm Staff Captain Kaparin. Fomin affably pushed a chair across to Gregor and seated himself on a chest. He must have realized from Gregor's face that the murder of the prisoner had had a depressing effect on him, for he said, You mustn't think we treat all our prisoners so sternly. That fellow was a member of a grain-collecting detachment, and we're not going to let such men go, or commissars either. But we spare others. Yesterday we captured three militiamen. We took their horses, saddles, and equipment, and set them free. There's no point in killing them. Gregor was silent. His hands resting on his knees, he was thinking his own thoughts, and he heard Fomin's voice as though in his sleep. And so we're fighting, as you can see, Fomin went on. But we think we'll raise the Cossacks all the same. The Soviet regime must die. By all the signs, there's war going on everywhere. Everywhere there are risings. In Siberia, and in the Ukraine, and even at Petrograd, the whole of the fleet has revolted in that fortress. What's it called? Kronstadt, Kaparin prompted him. Gregor raised his head, looked at Fomin with vacant, apparently unseeing eyes, and shifted his gaze to Kaparin. Have a smoke, Fomin held out his cigarette case. Well, and so Petrograd has been captured, and they're getting near Moscow. There's the same tune being played everywhere, and there's no reason why we should be dozing. We'll raise the Cossacks, sweep away the Soviet regime, and if the cadets give us any support, then our affairs will go well. Let their educated people set up a government, and we'll help them. He was silent for a moment, then asked, What do you think, Melyukov? If the cadets drive hard from the Black Sea and we unite with them, 
They'll give us credit for the fact that we were the first to rise in the rear of the Reds, won't they? Kaparin says, of course they will. For instance, surely they won't hold it against me that I led the 28th Regiment away from the front in 1918 and served the Soviet government for a couple of years? So that's what you're aiming at. You're a fool but a cunning one, thought Grigor, involuntarily smiling. Fomin awaited his answer. Evidently he was seriously concerned with this problem. Grigor reluctantly said, That's a long story. Of course, of course, Fomin willingly agreed. We shall see better later. But now we must act. We must smash the communists in their rear. In any case, we shan't allow them to live. They've put their infantry in wagons and are thinking of chasing after us. Let them try. While cavalry is being sent to their aid, we'll turn the entire region upside down. Grigor again gazed down at his feet, thinking. Kaparin excused himself and lay down on the bed. I get very tired. We make such mad marches and get little sleep, he said, smiling faintly. It's time we went to bed, too. Fomin rose and dropped his heavy hand on Grigor's shoulder. You were wise, Melyukov, to listen to my advice that day in Vyshenska. If you hadn't hidden, they'd have been on your tail. You'd have been lying now in Vyshenska, and your nails would have been rotting. I can see that as plain as a pike staff. Well, what have you decided? Speak up, and then let's get to bed. What am I to speak about? Will you join us, or what? You can't spend all your life hiding in other people's houses. Grigor had been expecting this question. Now he must make his choice. To go on wandering from village to village, living a hungry, homeless life and succumbing to a numb longing until the master betrayed him to the authorities, or to go to the political department and submit, or to join Fomin. And he made his choice. For the first time that evening, he looked straight into Fomin's face and said, twisting his lips into a smile, I've got as much choice as the hero has in the fairy story. Ride to the left and you'll lose your horse. Ride to the right and you'll be killed. I've got three roads and not one of them goes my way. You make your choice without any telling of fairy stories. We'll tell the fairy stories after. I've got nowhere to go, so I've chosen already. Well, I'll join your band. Fomin knitted his brow discontentedly and bit his mustache. You drop that word. Why call it a band? That's what the communists call us. But it's not for you to use the word. We're simply men who have revolted against the regime, short and clear. His dissatisfaction was only momentary. He was obviously delighted with Gregor's decision and could not conceal the fact. Animatedly rubbing his hands, he said, That's one more for our regiment. Do you hear, staff captain? We'll give you a troop, Melyukov. Or if you don't want to command a troop, you can be on the staff with Kaparin. I'll let you have my own horse. I've got a spare mount. Chapter 3 Towards dawn, a light frost set in. The puddles were filmed with dove-blue ice. The snow turned rough and crunched resonantly. The horse's hoofs left uncertain, crumbling, round imprints on the granular snowy pall and where the previous day's thaw had eaten at the snow, the bare earth with the dead last year's grass nestling against it was only slightly marked by the hoofs and gave way with a faint crack. Fomin's band drew up in a column outside the village. Far off along the road, the six horsemen of the advance reconnaissance patrol were occasionally to be seen. There's my army, Fomin said with a smile, riding up to Grigor. We could smash the devil himself with such lads. Grigor ran his eyes over the column and mournfully thought, If you and your army were to run up against my Budioni squadron, we'd turn you into a heap of bones in half an hour. Fomin pointed with his whip and asked, What do you think of them? Not bad for killing prisoners, and not bad for stripping the dead, but I don't know what they'd be like in a fight, Grigor answered dryly. Turning in his saddle with his back to the wind, Fomin lit a cigarette and said, You'll get a chance of seeing them in a fight, too. Most of my men are regular soldiers, and they don't let you down. Six two-horse wagons loaded with ammunition and supplies were placed in the middle of the column. Fomin galloped to the front and gave the order to advance. On the rise, he rode up to Grigor again and asked, 
Well, how's my horse? To your liking? He's a good horse. They rode along for some time in silence, stirrup to stirrup. Then Grigor asked, Are you thinking of going through Tatarsk? Wanting to see your people? I'd like to visit them. We may. At the moment, I'm thinking of turning towards the Chira to jolt and shake up the Cossacks a bit. But the Cossacks were not very willing to be shaken up. Grigor became convinced of that in his first few days with the band. When they occupied a village or district center, Fomin gave orders for a citizens' meeting to be held. Usually, he himself did the speaking, but sometimes Kaparin took his place. They ordered the Cossacks to arms, talked of the burdens which had been laid on grain growers by the Soviet regime, of the final ruin which will inevitably result if the Soviet government isn't overthrown. Fomin spoke not so grammatically and coherently as Kaparin, but more expansively, and in a language which the Cossacks understood. He usually ended his speech with set, memorized phrases. From today on, we free you from grain requisitioning. Don't cart any more grain to the collection points. It's time to stop feeding the communist drones. They've grown fat on your grain. But that foreign domination has ended. You are free people. Arm yourselves and support our regime. Hurrah, Cossacks! The Cossacks stared down at the ground and were morosely silent, but the women gave rein to their tongues. Venomous questions and shouts came from their massed ranks. Your regime sounds all right, but have you brought us any soap? Where do you keep your government, in your saddlebags? But whose grain are you living on? I suppose you'll be going from yard to yard to beg in a minute. They've got swords. They'll start cutting off the chickens' heads without asking permission. It's all very well telling us not to cart our grain, but you're here today and tomorrow there'll be no finding you even with hounds, while we'll have to answer for it. We won't let you have our husbands. You do your own fighting. And much else did the women shout in their great obduracy, for during the years of war they had grown fanatical in all their behavior, were afraid of a new war, and clung to their husbands with the obstinacy of despair. Fomin listened unconcernedly to their incoherent shouts. He knew their value. He waited until there was silence and turned to the Cossacks. And then they answered briefly and soberly, Don't oppress us, comrade Fomin. We've had enough of fighting. We've tried it. We rose in 1919. We haven't got anything to revolt with, and there's no point in it. We haven't any need for it at the moment. It's getting near time for sowing and not fighting. One day, someone shouted from the back of the crowd, You're talking sweetly enough now, but where were you in 1919 when we did rise? You've thought better of it rather late, Fomin. Grigor saw Fomin's face change, but the commander retained control of himself and made no answer. During the first week, Fomin generally listened quite calmly to the Cossacks' objections at the meetings and to their curt refusal to support his actions. Even the women's shouts and curses did not upset his equanimity. All right, we'll get them, he said arrogantly, smiling in his mustache. But when he became convinced that the great mass of the Cossack population was not friendly towards him, he completely changed in his attitude to those who spoke at the meetings. And now he talked without dismounting from his horse and did not so much argue as threaten. But the result was the same. The Cossacks on whom he had counted for support listened to him in silence and as silently began to disperse. At one of the villages, after Fomin had spoken, a Cossack widow made a speech in answer. A big woman, corpulent and large-boned, she spoke in an almost masculine voice and swung her arms violently like a man. Her broad, heavily pockmarked face was expressive of angry determination. Her large, thick, pouting lips were continually twisted in a contemptuous sneer. Pointing her swollen red hand in the direction of Fomin, who was sitting stonily in his saddle, she seemed almost to spit out the venomous words. What are you causing trouble here for? Where do you want to drive our Cossacks to? Into what hole? Hasn't this accursed war widowed enough of our women? Hasn't it orphaned enough of our children? Are you calling down new woes on our heads? 
And who is this Tsar Liberator that's turned up from the village of Rubiezhin? You should put your own house in order and make an end to your own ruin, and then you could teach us how to live and what regime to accept and what not. For in your own home, your own wife can't get free of the collar. We know that very well. But you've fluffed up your mustache and are riding about on a horse, upsetting the people. Yet on your own farm, if the wind didn't hold your hut up, it would have fallen down long ago. A fine teacher you are. What are you silent for, you knob? Is it lies I'm telling? A quiet laugh ran through the crowd. It rustled like a wind and died away. Fomin's left hand, lying on the saddlebow, slowly fingered the reins. His face darkened with restrained anger. But he remained silent, trying to think of a dignified way out of his awkward position. And what is this government of yours that you call on us to support it? The widow continued energetically, working herself up into a rage. She put her arms akimbo and slowly made towards Fomin, swinging her broad haunches. The crowd opened a way for her, hiding their smiles, drooping their laughing eyes. They cleared a ring as though for a dance, jostling one another. Your regime won't remain one moment on the earth after you're gone, the widow said in her low, deep voice. It drags after you and never lives more than an hour in any one spot. Today on your horse and tomorrow on your belly in the mud. That's who you are. And your regime's the same. Fomin violently kicked his heels into his horse's sides and rode the animal into the crowd. The people fell back in all directions. Only the widow was left in the middle of a great ring. She had seen many things in her time, and so she stared calmly at the snarling teeth of Fomin's horse, at Fomin's white, infuriated face. Riding his horse at her, he raised his whip high above her head. Hold your mouth, you speckled carrion. What are you carrying on agitation here for? Held high by the rein, the horse's muzzle with its bared teeth, hung right above the fearless woman's head. A pale green clot of foam flew from the bit and fell on her kerchief and from it to her cheek. She swept it away with her hand and fell back a step. So, you can speak and we mustn't, she shouted, gazing at Fomin with dilated, furiously glittering eyes. Fomin did not strike her. Shaking his whip, he roared, you Bolshevik infection, I'll thrash all the stupidity out of you. I'll give orders for your skirt to be pulled up over your head and for you to be beaten with ramrods. Then you'll grow wise in less than no time. The widow fell back another couple of steps and, unexpectedly turning her back on Fomin, stooped to the ground and threw up the back edge of her skirt. Haven't you ever seen anything like that before, Anika the warrior? she shouted, and, straightening up with amazing agility, she again turned to face Fomin. Me? Whip me? You haven't got a ring in your snout. Fomin spat furiously and drew on the reins, holding in his backstepping horse. Shut your mouth, you foalless mare. Are you so glad you've got so much meat to your carcass? He said in a loud voice, and turned his horse round, vainly trying to look stern. A muffled, stifled laughter ran through the crowd. To save his commander's insulted honor, one of Fomin's men ran up to the widow, swinging the butt of his carbine. But a healthy-looking Cossack, a couple of heads taller than he, shielded the woman with his own broad shoulders and quietly but promisingly said, None of that. Three other villagers also swiftly came up and pushed the widow back. One of them, a youngster with bristling hair, whispered to the Fomin man, What are you swinging your rifle for, eh? It's easy enough to kill a woman. You go and show your pluck out in the fields. We can all be brave in the backyards. Fomin rode off at a walking pace to the fence, then stood in his stirrups. Cossacks, think it over well, he cried, addressing the slowly dispersing crowd. We're asking you decently enough now, but we'll be back in a week, and then we'll talk in a different language. For some reason, his mood had changed to one of merriment, and laughing, holding in his prancing horse, he shouted, We're not cowards. You can't frighten us with women's arses. We've seen them pockmarked and with all sorts of other marks. We'll come back, and if none of you joins our detachments voluntarily, 
We shall mobilize all the young Cossacks by force. Understand that? We haven't got time to cuddle you and gaze into your eyes. Laughter and animated conversation arose among the crowd, which had halted for a moment. Still smiling, Fomin gave the order, To horse! Livid with suppressed laughter, Gregor rode off to his troop. Extended along the miry road, the Fomin detachment rode over the top of the rise, and the inhospitable village was concealed from sight. But Gregor still smiled from time to time as he thought, It's a good thing we Cossacks like our fun. Jokes are more frequent guests with us than sorrow, and God grant that it may always be so. For if life were all serious, I'd have hanged myself long ago. His cheerful mood remained with him for a long time, and only at the halt did he think anxiously and bitterly that they were not going to succeed in raising the Cossacks, and that all Fomin's schemes were doomed to inevitable disaster. Chapter 4 Spring came on. The sunlight now had more warmth to it. The snow melted on the southern slopes of the hills, and at noonday the earth, rusty with last year's grass, gave off a translucent lilac mist. In the warm patches on the mounds, half buried under the quartz boulders, showed the first brilliantly green, slender growths of honey grass. The plowed lands were bared. From the abandoned winter roads, the rooks migrated to the threshing floors, to the winter cornfields flooded with thaw water. In the ravines and dells, the snow lay blue, soaked to the surface with moisture. From these spots, a harsh cold still breathed. But in the gullies, the spring brooklets, invisible to the eye, were already thinly and melodiously gurgling under the snow and in the glades the branches of the poplars were beginning to display an almost imperceptible tender vernal green. The season for field labor was approaching, and Fomin's band melted away more and more with every day. The morning, after a halt for the night, two or three men would be missing, and one day almost half a troop vanished. Eight men with their horses and equipment went off to Vyshenska to surrender. It was time to plow and sow. The earth was calling, drawing the Cossacks to work. And convinced that the struggle was useless, many of Fomin's men secretly deserted from the band and rode off to their homes. There remained only the wild men who could not return in any case, men whose crimes against the Soviet regime were too great for them to hope for pardon. But the first day of April, Fomin had not more than 86 sabers under his command. Gregor still remained with the band. He lacked the courage to go home. He was firmly convinced that Fomin's cause was lost and that sooner or later the band would be broken up. He knew that at the first serious clash with any regular Red Army cavalry, they would be smashed to the last man. Yet he remained under Fomin, secretly hoping to hang on somehow until the summer and then seize a couple of the best horses in the detachment gallop at night to Tatarsk, and thence with Oxenia to the south. The dawn step was broad, spacious. There were many lonely tracks and expanses in it. In summertime all the roads were open and shelter could be found everywhere. He thought to abandon the horses somewhere, to make his way with Oxenia on foot to the Kuban, to the Caucasian foothills, far from their native spots, and live there through the troublous times. There was no other way out, it seemed to him. On Kaparin's advice, Fomin decided to cross to the left bank of the Don before the ice broke up. On the confines of the Hapiersk region, where there were many forests, he hoped to lie concealed from pursuit if necessary. The band crossed the Don above the village of Ribni. In places where the current ran swiftly, the ice had already been carried away. Under the bright April sun, the water glittered as though covered with silvery scales. But where the winter track had been built up, rising a couple of feet above the level of the ice, the dawn stood immovable. They laid down wattles over the broken edge, led the horses across one by one, fell in on the farther side, and sending a reconnaissance patrol on ahead, moved in the direction of Yelanska district. The following day, Gregor chanced to see a fellow villager from Tatarsk. 
The one-eyed old man was on his way to relatives at Gryaznovsky and ran into the band not far from the village. Gryagor led the old man aside and asked, Are my children alive and well, Grandad? God preserve them, Gryagor Pantulievich. They're alive and well.